A reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 4, verse 16 onwards. When he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Blessed Mother, intercede and pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Kindly be seated. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How are you? This is the third day of the retreat. Yes, it's the third day of the retreat. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, fourth day of the retreat. I told you I'm not getting any of my numbers right. So uh, it's the fourth day of the retreat. You've made your confessions. We are moving towards um, your, your inner healing sessions, which will take place tomorrow as well. And I'm presuming you all are couples, apart from the sisters and nuns who are here. Um, so this is supposed to be a session for couples, is what I was told. So um, uh, don't worry, sister, you're married to Jesus. So we, we, kind, of, uh, we kind of work... Uh, work it around in that way. As, as we are in the presence of the Lord, it's important for us to look um, deeper. We always want Jesus to touch us. We never come into the presence of the Lord without a prayer on our lips or some prayer within our heart. That's how we always see ourselves in the presence of Jesus. I want to be touched by the Lord. But so often the thing we desire the touch we desire is more exterior. We spend a lot on our exteriors. We spend a lot looking at ourselves in the mirror as well. Isn't that true? Yes. We, we look especially, um, compared to, uh, compared to the, the group that is there. You know, the group that is there, the youth, I think they look lesser in the mirror than we look. They look with anticipation we look with regret. You, know, you see more of the wrinkles and then you're, you're so miserable. Why am I so wrinkled? That's because you're old. But, and then we are the ones who apply more of the wrinkle-free creams. Um, wrinkle-free creams basically means that you get free wrinkles with it. And, and it doesn't work. We, we kind of try to stretch our skins. We look at our hair. If there is anything left on top, then we look at the color of it, and that disturbs us. We, we try to work so much on our exteriors. We are people who always look forward to looking better. And as time goes, it becomes even more harder to accept that age is catching up. And so we spend so much of time and energy on just looking at who we are on the outside and trying to get that right. I think first we need to get that out of our mind, that we are not 22, that we are you know, 46, 52, 63, 85, whatever it is that we are who we are. And it's time for us not to, not to try and look back to who I was before and live in the past 
of who I was before. When I, when I left from here in 2013, I went to Sydney to start our retreat center over there. And um, when I went over there, we, the, the priests were playing with some youngsters. Uh, they were playing indoor basketball. It was amazing because, because the, uh, the, the, the indoor stadium had this, this uh, it was a kind of a soft flooring. So that's how they played on, on, on the international uh, level as well. And I've never played on one that way, but I've, I love the game. So the moment I saw all of them playing, I went as well. And I started playing, thinking in my mind that I'm 22. And I was trying to move like I was 22. I'm sure everyone over there looked and understood that I'm not 22. I'm the only person who didn't believe it till I jumped for a shot and I heard a pop on my knee and my cartilage broke. And that's when I realized I am not 22. I think it's important we realize we've got to stop concentrating on our exteriors because there's far more deep within that needs to be dealt with. For us, over a period of time, when we, when we stop looking at who we are on the outside and start looking on who we are on the inside and the impacts that is making not only on ourselves, but also on the people around us, that is when we will start genuinely asking the Lord for healing. Healing not for our physical self. I think it's time we stopped praying for physical healing. Now, don't take me in the wrong term. Not that Jesus cannot do it. But I think we spend a lot of energy on that. There are times I've given talks after talks about praying for our soul to be cleansed, to be prepared to go into God's kingdom. How many of you would like to go to God's kingdom? Don't say all. You should never speak for others because then you'll be held responsible for what the other does as well. Praise the Lord. We struggle to get ourselves in. So just imagine trying to get someone else in as well. So how many of you would like to get into God's kingdom? Praise God. That's good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How many of you would like to go tonight? Praise the Lord. For that, we need to be prepared. Sometimes we don't even act like we are preparing ourselves for that. We, are rather, we rather act like we are preparing ourselves to remain here forever and ever. Amen. Father, pray my hand is paining. Father, pray my leg is paining. I've given talks on, on, on uh, cleansing of the soul and immediately after the talk, there'll be someone who will come here. Father, I have a back pain. Please pray. I'm so sorry, you're old. <laughs> you and I are one day going to die. That's the reality of our life. It's time to start looking within. It's time that we, we change this, this whole concept of, of just treating Jesus as a healer, but to understand Jesus as a redeemer. The one who is preparing our hearts and our souls to enter into his kingdom. He's waiting to, to invite us into his presence. And we are resisting entering into his presence. I always think the, the change that has come over Christianity today, and maybe it's one of the reasons why a lot of the younger generation don't want to come to church anymore. The whole idea we've given them about faith is from the time they are small, you ask, you pray, and Jesus will give you. We turned him into a beautiful vending machine. He will give you, he will give you, he will give you. We never spoke to our young ones, speak to Jesus because he will love you. Speak to Jesus because he will be with you. It's always, ask Jesus, he will give you. When you're studying, you pray, Jesus will give you a good result. And not every time is this vending machine going to keep answering our whims and fancies of a prayer. 
So it's all about building a relationship. What kind of a relationship do I have with Jesus? And that relationship, the more deeper I enter into it, the more I start understanding where I need healing. So the physical self is only the tip of the iceberg. That's what we complain when, when someone judges us as well. Isn't that true? Yes. I've seen, I've seen brother before. I don't know your name. What's your name, sir? M-O? M-A-U-R-O. Moro. So I've seen Moro before. I've, I've seen him here in the retreat center before as well. You haven't changed one. in Tabor as well. Okay. I've come home as well. Oops, that's not very good. <laughs> Uh, praise the Lord. In Goa? In Bangalore. Okay. Praise God. So I've seen, I've seen Moro before. And when I've seen Moro before, he's kind of, he looks the same you know, that he was before as well. But how much do I know of Moro? If I judge Moro today, I know only the tip of the iceberg. I know a physical self. Isn't that what we all, how we always defend our actions as well? Someone judges us and we say, what do they know about us? What do they know about what I'm going through? What do they know about my life? Because that's all hidden behind. The physical self is just the tip of the iceberg of who we actually are. There's so much more that we are within. That means when we are praying to the Lord and asking the Lord, keep me ever young, keep me ever healthy, keep, keep me away from sickness, we are praying for something that is so tiny in our life. There's so much more we are. There's so much more there is within us that requires prayers, that requires healing. And that is why I think it's more important for us to pray for our inner wounds to be healed. Now, I know there are many of you over here who have attended inner healing retreats before. So, it's, it's very difficult to give an inner healing talk when you have a mixed crowd. One crowd that knows about inner healing, there's one crowd that doesn't know anything about inner healing. So, I'm kind of going to keep it a bit general, just to give you a framework. Because what is important is not this talk, what is important is the preparation you're going to do for the inner healing session. So that's more important than just the, the talk. This talk in itself will do nothing for you. This talk is leading towards something, and that's important. What, what you do during the inner healing session that I presume you will be having tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. When I'm giving this talk, can I uh, ask a favor? I would like you to please smile during the session. Uh, don't sit miserable. Um, can you smile during the session? I need you to smile, not for your sake, but for my sake. Because looking at a set of people depressed leads anyone to depression. So I don't want to be depressed. Tomorrow I have to go back to Colombo. And, and everyone generally asks me, Oh, Father, is it miserable over there? In Colombo, are you all struggling without food? Only my mother didn't ask me. She said, oh, you're looking healthy. So <laughs> she's the only one who said, you're looking very healthy. Praise God. <laughs> so um, so, so people, people might think that the problem is there. But when I go back depressed, they will never ever send me back over here. Because you people get me depressed. So see to it that you smile. The youth were amazing during the first two days. It was just amazing. Their smiles were really, really beautiful. Maybe for us, the smiles have just got wiped out. We don't know how to smile. Praise the Lord. Maybe we have too many burdens in our heart. We don't know how to smile. Don't worry, put up plastic smiles for my sake. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verse 11 onwards, we read about the, the, the 10 lepers who get touched and healed. Luke, chapter 17. 10 lepers get touched and healed. They cry out to Jesus. The lepers cry out to Jesus asking for a healing. That's Luke chapter 17, verse 11 onwards. They cry out, the ten lepers approach Jesus. Keeping their distance, they called out saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. 
And so they start moving toward the, towards the priest. Why did Jesus ask them to go and show themselves to the priest? It was the custom for what? If you're unclean by leprosy, if you need to rejoin the community, you have to be, yes, you have to test leprosy negative. COVID positive, COVID negative. I'm just trying to use something that we can understand now. But that is what the priests needed to do. They needed to certify that the person is worthy to come back into the community. The leprosy is not there. And that is why he tells them, you go towards the priest. As they are walking, they find out that they have been healed. Now, one person turns back, comes back to Jesus and thanks the Lord. What happens to the other nine? What happens to the other nine? I can't hear you. You sound like old people. Praise the Lord. The others went towards... They went towards the priest. Obviously, they went towards the priest because after that, where do they get to go? They were to go, get to go back home. That's what they want. They want to go back home. Only one person decides... He's going to come back to Jesus. And the Lord makes a note of it. And the Lord says, did only one of you think it right to come and thank God? Now, did Jesus ask them to come back? And why is he making a big deal out of this? He didn't even ask for it. But it was important. Certain things you don't need to be told. And, and they come, he comes back. And he thanks the Lord, and the Lord tells him in Luke chapter 17, verse, Luke chapter 17, verse 19, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. So the other nine, were they healed? Was this man healed as well? Then what was the difference between the nine? Because Jesus has just told him, go your way, your faith has made you well. There's a difference between healing and being well. You know, nowadays they have this concept, you have wellness, uh, wellness clinics. It's not only, it's holistic healing. It's not just uh, directed towards just one portion of your life, but it's directed towards your whole person. So when Jesus is speaking about a healing, for, for the leper, there was a leprosy on the exterior. Can you imagine a leper who has experienced leprosy, who is going to go back home? What do you think is going to be his or her mindset? Where were the lepers staying? They were living, living in leper colonies. What do you feel when you're living in leper colonies? How many of you got COVID during, um, during the pandemic? It's still supposed to be going on. Okay. And when you got COVID, what happened? You were? Isolation, right? How did it feel? Just sitting inside there. And then how were your family members? You know, when they come and they leave plate outside, and then you have to open the door, you have to take that plate and nobody will touch that plate. You might have the odd mother, you know, my poor child. But all the others, <laughs> you're COVID. You stay away. The feeling of being rejected. So when these nine are still going back home, they're going to be going back with what? With a lot of hurt. There's a community that has rejected them. In John chapter 5, we read about the, the, the paralyzed man who was paralyzed for 38, 38 long years by the pool of Bethsaida. Do you remember that? So there's a pool of Bethsaida. The angel of the Lord comes and he touches the water. When he touches the water, the first person who jumps into the pool would get healed. So what do you think everyone's waiting for? Everyone's waiting for the angel to come and touch. And everyone's around like the swimming pool, the first person who jumps in. There's a man who's waiting for 38 years. Jesus comes to him and Jesus asks him, 
do you want to be made well do you want to be made well and what is the answer lord there is no one lord i have no one can i ask you how many of you want to be made well or do you want to be healed do you want to be healed praise the lord do you want to be healed isn't that an easy question isn't that an easy answer then why is it that this man says lord i have no one shouldn't he have just said lord i want to be healed it was either yes or no but he says lord i have i have no one have you imagined a man sitting for 38 years lying down for 38 years you're not just talking about 38 months you're talking about 38 years maybe after the first year or second year his family that waited for an opportunity to put him in after some time they got tired and they leave and they go having no one for 38 years so when jesus speaks and addresses his leprosy he's telling the lord there's something far more deeper within me dear friends what we experience your physical wounds and your aches and your pains even your cancer that you might be going through i'm telling you there is something far deeper within ourselves that we are battling with somewhere deep within our heart that we cry that we are either alone we are broken we don't know why we act the way we act we don't know why we react in such negative ways we don't know why we have characteristical and behavioral defects that we've been praying for for so long but nothing changes i am an angry person I'm just an angry person that's my nature how many times we hide behind the excuse that this is my nature how many of you struggle with anger you just raise your hands you can just burst out and you have just no control over that it's okay don't don't feel don't feel shy about it there's one set that will honestly raise their hands the other set would like to raise their hands and just keep it you know in the pocket i'd rather not let anyone know we hide behind an excuse that that's my nature i'm sorry a person is not born with a nature of being angry you can get angry that's fine but i cannot have a nature that is angry that cannot be my nature our nature is to be like god that is our nature there's certain things that make us do what we do and that will have a root cause somewhere that needs to be dealt with that needs prayer that needs healing so it's time we came out of this concept that this is my nature and hid behind every that's that's more of a defensive attitude i know i can't do anything about it so my excuse and my explanation is this is my nature people who have terribly perverted minds and just cannot get rid of that perversion or even the perversions of of sexuality the kind of sexuality and the perversions and the way i express that sexuality that's just my nature it's one of the easiest expressions to make that's just my nature is there something that requires the lord's touch is there something that is actually bothering me you know when a thorn a tiny thorn gets into your gets into your hand or gets into your leg and you you kind of you run your hands over it and you don't feel anything but you know there's something you press and you know that pain is there but you keep looking and you keep looking and you just cannot find it that is how inner wounds are for us it's one of the most it's one of the most deeply hidden parts of our life deep within that requires a healing if i hide behind excuses of things being just my nature i will never pray for the lord to heal me 
if I don't believe something is a problem, I am not going to pray for it. If I don't believe my anger is a problem and you just have to live with it, I'm not going to pray for it. Because I'm at, I'm at peace with this nature. But the only problem is no one else is at peace with that nature. Physical wounds, if you're at peace with your physical ailments, praise God. Inner wounds, when you start getting to be at peace with those wounds, you're in trouble. Because you're destroying others as well. Physical ailments, it is my battle. Inner wounds, I'm creating battles for others. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Are you people smiling? Oh, what liars. You'll have to go and get, go for confession all over again. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Can one of you read that for me, please? I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being, that you may be strengthened in your inner being. There's an inner being that requires the Lord's healing. And I've been praying for my outer being to look perfect. Forget about the outer being. It's okay, fine. Now it's only downward for us on the outward being. That's the reality. I'm 46. I know everything creaks. And you might think that 46 is not too bad. I'm thinking 46, I'm not going to get to 60 the way I'm going. I've, 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 I've slipped this. I've had surgeries on both my knees. Everything aches and pains. I've been on Panadols for the past few, few days because I've been having problems with my back. Every which way. Now it's only downhill. Physically, it's downhill. When physically, it's downhill. Interiorly, we better be uphill. Because that means the time is coming. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so it's important. I pray that you may be healed in your inner being. And the reason why I say it's so important to pray for that is the impact it is making on your families. How many of you are married for 25 years plus? Wow, that's a big number. Praise the Lord. 25 years. You know, I see the youth over there. And they're all preparing to enter into. And I'm praying that they'll have a very, very good inner healing session. It's needed. And you need to pray for that as well. Because all of them were you 25 years earlier. You were that. And you carried all these inner wounds into your marriage. And when you carry wounds into a marriage, you end up wounding the other as well. What is there within triggers at some point or the other? So whatever wounds are there within all our experiences of the past, every negative experience from the time we are in our mother's womb, we are already receptive to the world outside. That is why some people get very excited. They'll come, Father, when I read the word of God, my little one is moving around. Praise God. We don't know if, it is, if the little one is moving around in rebellion or in joy. <laughs> well, most probably it will be joy. It's a child. <laughs> it's the ones who come out. <laughs> then we are in rebellion. Praise the Lord. But how much the child experiences everything, the father or the mother. So it's not just about what the mother is feeling. What the father is feeling as well. That means as human people, I don't think this is any rocket science for us to understand that. We don't need to actually be proved scientifically that a child within the womb actually is responding to the parents outside. We are human beings. There's an aura around us. We feel each other. 
I find it very, very amusing when people say, oh, scientifically it makes no sense. You don't need science for that. We will never ask when a mother feels that her child is maybe not in the same house, is in another state or in another country, and the mother just feels something's not right with my child today. I need to call. And you know that that, that call makes that huge difference because the daughter or the son says, I really was waiting for your call. And we don't ask for scientific explanations for that. A child within the womb relating to what the parent is doing on the outside is very, very normal. We are human beings, we will. And so whatever positive experiences happen, the child imbibes it. Whatever negative experiences happen, the child imbibes it as well. And then from that age of being in the mother's womb, Starting from that age, every phase of our life, we are just soaking things inside. Positive experiences, negative experiences. The positive experiences leads to all our wonderful characteristics that we have. The negative experiences leads to all the behavioral and character faults that we have. And that needs to be dealt with. For years, imagine, you entered into a marriage and your spouse has had to bear with those wounds. Till that time, your parents bore up with those wounds. It is easier for them to bear it up because it's like, you know, um, uh, I, I realized I'm losing hair is very recently, but my my, the, the person who is to, so I was in Melbourne before I came to, uh, I came to Colombo. And my, uh, my hairdresser, the barber over there, we, we call them the hairdresser over there. So it was a lady and she, she said, oh, uh, this time your hair seems thick. And I didn't understand what she meant when she said that. But after I came here, suddenly one day I can see, I can see my scalp a lot. And then I realized, oh, okay, I am losing hair. Now that's because every day I'm looking at it. I haven't noticed the difference. She gets to see it only in between. She's noticed the difference. And that is how it is with our parents bearing up with our wounds. We think we were perfectly fine and my wife or my husband is making a big deal. My parents never had a problem with me. And so whose problem it must be? It must be your problem. The problem is not that. The problem is the fact that your parents from the beginning have been seeing you and they've kind of adjusted to who you are. And now suddenly from nowhere, this new person gets to experience this very new, strange characteristic that you have. And your response is, if my mother could deal with it, why can't you deal with it? That's because it's a totally different experience for them. It's a wound, a scar within us that is being manifested and someone else is struggling to bear with it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now if you've been 25 years, maybe you'd say now at least she should have adjusted or I should have adjusted. No, it doesn't work that way. We pray for the healing to take place. We ask Jesus to heal the inner wounds. Don't think that time heals anything. How many of you believe time is a healer? All those who believe time is a healer? Now because of my statement just before this, that's the reason why you know this is not the answer. Praise the Lord. Time is no healer. Time is a suppressor. Time will only suppress things. What is suppressed at some point, it has to, it has to come out. That is definite. What is suppressed will come out at some stage. Here in this retreat center, I, I came across a father and a son. So the father brought the son to me uh, for prayers. The son was, I think, around, around 21. I know definitely 21, but I think around 21, 22 or so. The father came with the son for the counseling. And during those times, I used to sit outside for the, for the counseling on the, on the veranda. And uh, he came to me and he told me, Father, please pray for my son. He has a devil in him. 
you know, sometimes when the parents can't understand what the child is going through, that's kind of the answer. My child has a devil. Do a deliverance. So he has a devil in him. And I looked at the son, and the son had this very sarcastic smile. And I thought, maybe it's true. And then I, I, I looked at him and, and then I told the father, can you stand aside? And when the father went and stood aside, this son looked at me and said, father, no devil or anything. I will tell you what the problem is. He said, my dad was in the army and at home it was military rule. Everything had to be perfect. And if it wasn't, he'd scream his gut out. It was terrible, father. And I kept this all the time he'd scream, I suppressed it, I suppressed it. And then he said, I reached my 18th birthday. And 18, I thought once I touch 18, you know, things will change. According to us here in 18, you're supposed to be an adult because you can vote. So you're supposed to be an adult at 18. And so he said, at 18, I thought my father will treat me a bit more like an adult. No difference. 18 came, 18 went, he would still scream at me. 21st birthday celebration in the house and he said we gave a big party and it was my 21st birthday and I thought you know 21st birthday now definitely he will treat me like an adult 21st birthday party is happening something happened I made a mistake somewhere something fell and my father screamed out in front of everyone and he said father that 20 years of all that was suppressed I gave it back that day. I burst out and I screamed back. And from that day onwards, he's been walking around telling everyone that I have a devil in me. <laughs> that is just something that's suppressed. What is suppressed has to come out. You'll keep it suppressed for some time. Till there's a moment when you will, it will trigger. And then we think, from where did that come? It came from a wound of the past. It happens very often even in marriage. The reason why I say it happens in marriage is sometimes marriage becomes the trigger for many of these wounds. When you are with your family, you are the small one. When you enter into the marriage, you're either entering into a marriage where the male thinks I will dominate the woman or the woman then battles and thinks I have equal rights as the man. So it's basically now a level playing field. That is where all the triggers start. And there is responses because you know that you can, you can respond. And that is where it becomes a full-blown problem and we start thinking that the other has an issue. The issue is not with the other, the issue is with me. I need to deal with my inner wounds. I need to acknowledge my inner past, my inner experiences, my, my past experiences of pain and struggles that I've gone through. It could come in the form of words. It could come in the form of experiences. It could come in the form of things that people have done to you. But wounds can happen in different forms and we can carry it with us all our life. It's pretty much like in today's terms, if you want to understand it, you, some of you said you got COVID. One of the things they say about COVID is for the next six, seven months, you will still carry the elements of the virus within you. You will still have the after effects of it. For some people, they've not been able to sleep after they've got, uh, after they've got a bout of COVID. They've just not been able to sleep for months. So there is, there is an impact, it's there within. It's lying dormant, it's lying quiet. It's just waiting its time to start manifesting in different forms that we are experiencing. That is why it's important that you start praying for your wounds to get healed. Asking the Lord to open up all those areas where you might have been, might have been wounded by people or by situations around you as well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Now, for you, you will have one set of wounds till your marriage, and then you will have another set of wounds after your marriage. So one who is, who is wounded enters into the marriage and then wounds the other. So now 
these wounds are post-marriage wounds. There's a pre-marriage wounds and there are post-marriage wounds. And then you will carry those wounds within you and start reacting to those wounds as well. Take things like I, I, I came across a, a, a woman actually here in the retreats. She wasn't staying here in the retreat center. She came for a retreat over here. But she came to me with a very peculiar problem. She said, Father, I'm terrified of cooking. She's terrified of cooking. is because every time from the first day onwards, the husband would make a big deal about anything that went wrong in the food. Sound similar? Yeah, they know. Praise the Lord. The rice is boiled, a bit more extra. A little bit of salt. I don't want to eat. Stop looking that side. Your wife is not shaking the head. Praise the Lord. Don't you reveal home secrets. <laughs> but she, she came to me and she said, Father, I'm terrified. I stand in front of the, of the uh, cooking range and she said, I shiver and I shake when I cook. Because from the first day of the marriage, this is how the husband has been reacting to the food. Now it is an inner wound for her. She just cannot, she just cannot handle cooking. She said, there are days when I, without him knowing, I've actually gone and bought things from outside, put it into the dish and served it to him. Because she's terrified. She had to pray here a lot for that inner healing to take place. I actually called the husband and we had a good chat. He didn't think that he was doing anything wrong. Praise the Lord. Sometimes we don't even realize for the husband, it must be an inner wound he himself is carrying for many years. Not knowing how to respond to a situation where everything doesn't work according to his plans. He has an inner wound that he has to deal with himself. So you look into your heart and see, how are the ways I react to certain situations? Which places my behavioral pattern is actually causing pain to people around me as well? One of the best ways to do it, but it can lead to fa family problems, is asking your spouse about it. But you look into your own heart and ask and see, what has your spouse been complaining about? What does your spouse feel most hurt about? You know, sometimes you have, a, like a person came to me and said, Father, I've got a wonderful wife. She's really an amazing person, but I'm tired of this marriage. And that was one of the first times I ever heard someone say that. I've got a wonderful wife, but I'm tired of the marriage. And asked, is there someone else? He said, no, Father, she's an amazing woman. But, Father, she won't give me peace at all. The moment I step out of the house, the calls will come. Where are you? If I'm going to work, the first call, I'll barely be in the lift. And the first call, where are you? I'm in the lift. It's only five minutes. I get into the car, where are you? I reach the office, where are you? And if, if she messages, if I don't message immediately back, there'll be 10, 15 messages after that. Sound similar? Familiar? Sorry. Praise the Lord. All the time. And then when we were speaking and we were praying, it, it was revealed why this, this lady was struggling. As she could recall, when she was very small, she was in a railway station with her parents and her, and her uh, large extended family. One set of the family is going in one direction, catching one train. The other set of the family is going in another direction, in another, another train. Somewhere along the way in our big Indian joint families where everyone seems to be in the station all the time, they got mixed up. She, thinking she's holding her father's hand, has held her uncle's hand, got into the wrong train. And the trains left, and that is when they've come to know that she's with them. And during those times, there's no mobiles, so you cannot give a call. So one set is frantically searching for a lost daughter. The other set is trying to get the lost daughter back. And so they got down at one of the stations, had to then come back. Ultimately, they found each other. But from that time onwards, she is struggling with an anxiety within her. Anyone she loves moves away. She needs to know where they are. 
whoever it is she needs to know where they are now it might sound amazingly beautiful that your wife is checking up if you're okay but that is a wound you might think as a wife you know i care for my husband that is why i'm doing it for him it is questioning his freedom it's questioning his his faithfulness there's two totally different understandings of how a wound is looked at so praying and asking the lord lord i ask you which areas of my life are wounded which situations of my life cause scars deep within you need to pray for the lord to bring his healing upon you praise the lord that is why as the scripture says i have come to heal the i have come to heal the broken hearted i have come to heal those who are troubled psalm psalm 147 verse 3 Psalm 147 verse 3 Can one of you read that for me Psalm 147 verse 3 Psalm 147 verse 3 He heals the broken hearted and he binds up their wounds he heals the broken hearted and he binds up their wounds so you in confidence one of the problems with inner wounds is if it is too deep we have a tendency to build walls i will not let anybody touch that wound it's pretty much like if i cut my hand and it is just kind of healing or it's paining will i put out that hand to anyone else for them to touch it no i will hold it back if it is hurting me i will hold it back i will not let anyone touch it there are some wounds within us that can be so deep and so painful that the reaction a human person has is to build a wall around it the problem with the wall is you will not let anyone touch it nor will you go back to it so you don't want to see what's beyond the wall that's when we live in denial do you have a problem no i don't have a problem there sometimes i've i've sat for counselings and you'll have the the wife bring usually it happens with the wives that's why i say the wives bringing the husbands and saying father please speak to him father please speak to him sometimes your wives thinks think that we with a few words are going to change everything around for them it doesn't work that way when you actually force them and make them sit in front of a priest nothing happens because there are times they'll sit in front and we are trying to bring out anything nothing do you have a problem no father nothing at all how is your marriage it's amazing father now what do you tell to a person that way the wife has just said you've got a miserable marriage father he's all the time angry he's all the time upset don't tell him that i told you all this <laughs> and then bring him and put him over there now i can't tell him you know you, your marriage is not okay she just told me because she told me that the marriage has a problem now i can't tell that because she said don't tell and so i ask him how is your marriage it's amazing father do you feel that you're a good husband i'm an amazing husband i'm so understanding i'm so caring i don't see a problem with myself and don't think that that is because they don't actually they have not actually started to believe that they actually believe it it's just that there is a wall and they will never look beyond that wall for them it doesn't exist because they've closed it up cemented it never to get never to be opened up again praise the lord hallelujah you need to break that wall down because when you have that wall and when you build that wall not only will you not give anyone else access to it not only will you yourself not access it you will not let jesus access it because in your mind it hurts a very clear example of this is child abuse when a person has been abused as a child one way is living a, a faulty reality thinking that i was responsible for it that's why you ask if you ask children who were abused one of the things they will struggle with is guilt they think that they have 
they have played along, that they have agreed. Every time they kept quiet or they felt on their body that it was something that was pleasurable, they feel that they are guilty. And that is what predators usually take advantage of. And so children with child abuse will start building walls. They will not let anybody into that space. And when you have a problem, especially as deep as child abuse, imagine the places it has an impact on. The way you look at your own sexuality, the way you look at other people's sexuality, the way you address your sexual relationship with your spouse. Everything is so deeply connected. And if I've built a wall and I'm not going to touch it, all my life, with myself and with my spouse on something about something that is so essential to marriage, I'm battling, but I'm not asking for healing. So there could be areas where you have built a wall. Be honest with yourself. Today you have whole of this evening, you have tomorrow as well. Spend some real good time in prayer. That is why I said, what I'm telling you now, this is actually not even the real way, the, the normal way I take an inner healing session. Because honestly, I don't believe an inner healing session can be taken in one talk. It, we leave it incomplete. And I find it very, very awkward to do that. That's why I'm just giving you a kind of a framework around which I hope you'll be able to build because some of you uh, have been for sessions before. But what I want you to do, don't concentrate on just what, what this session is. It's about what you're going to do now. It's going to be important for your inner healing tomorrow. So when you're sitting in prayer, and I don't know if, if you've been keeping silence during this, this time, it would be good to now just go into a silence. Go into a silence and start asking the Lord. If you want, you can write it down on your book. What kind of areas of your life you have been wounded? It doesn't mean that I've attended an inner healing session before, so now I'm perfectly okay. No. We are human beings. We carry wounds all the time. If I'm nasty with you now, I've given you a wound already. The only difference is fresher wounds get healed easily, and the older wounds take a lot of time to get healed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's very important. Don't live in denial. Be honest. Start looking, for, especially for those of you who are married or for those of you who are in religious life. For us in religious life, our superiors would have noted something about us. Our reaction is, what do they know about us? All the time they're condemning us. It's a very easy way to live behind the wall. And I won't touch it. So uh, for, for the mar married couples, Think of those things that your spouses point out all the time. There has to be some truth in it. Now, you can live in denial and think, no, I don't do any of that. Be honest for once and say, Lord, maybe there is something that is there in my past, something that requires a healing. I ask you to reveal it to me. The Holy Spirit will start revealing things to us. But for that, we need to be open. If you are not open, the Spirit will not speak to us. If you are open, the Spirit will speak to us. And the Spirit will tell us those areas of our life. Like Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, He will tell you all the truth. He will reveal to you what you need to know. So you start asking the Spirit from today, reveal to me which areas of my life require healing. Re reveal to me which areas of my life have wounds. Reveal to me the walls that, that I have built and what lies beyond those walls. And I'm telling you, if you ask the Spirit to do it, He will definitely reveal it to you, either through this day, tomorrow, or during the inner healing session. It will definitely happen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Apply that to all the fears that you have within you. If you're struggling with fears, how many of you have fear of darkness? Can you raise your hands? Yes, irrational fears of darkness. You get into any dark space and that's it. You are terrified. How many of you have that problem? Okay. Don't worry. That's, that comes from an inner wound. 
normal fear of darkness is fine. Anything that is irrational. So you have a fear of certain animals. How many of you have fear of, of um, snakes? Irrational fear. You can see it a mile away or you just get to hear that it was there and that's it. Okay, that comes from an inner wound, either through how it has been presented to you, how you have heard stories about it when you're small, and how deeply it has cut through your heart. My sister had irrational fear of cats. Terrible fear. She can see it a mile away and that is it. And what is even more interesting is, her daughter has the exact same fear and the exact same reaction to the fear. I was amazed, she lives in Bahrain, and, and when I went there for a retreat, I got to spend some time with the, with the family. And we were walking on the, on the road, and near this dumps, dumpster, there was a lot of cats, and suddenly I can see my niece run right across the road. She would rather get knocked down by the cars than be near the cat. And I was shocked, because this was exactly my sister's behavior, to the T. How things just get passed on. So don't take it very lightly. It actually defines the person you are. Sadly, our wounds end up defining the person we are. It should be our, our, our good characteristic, characteristics that define the people we are. But so often it is, so when people speak about, oh, that person who gets angry all the time, that person who says all those bad words all the time, that's the way we are being referred to. It defines who you are, then it's time to get healed. It's time to ask the Lord for his healing touch. Praise the Lord. Can we all stand? Let's close our eyes, hold our hands close to our heart. Pray and ask the Lord at this time. Lord, we thank you for what you've made us. We are wonderfully made in your image and likeness. But Lord, our lives are so often afflicted by wounds. The scars that lie deep within, starting from when we were in our mother's womb till today. And Lord, we realize that as a result of those wounds, how often within our marriage, within our vocations, we have ended up wounding others. We have wounded our children, we have wounded our spouses. Lord, we do not want to look back and sit with regret, but rather we pray for healing. All those areas of our life that remained wounded, hurt, broken, we pray today, Jesus, through the power of your precious blood, bring healing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus said, come to me, you who are tired, and I will give you rest. Divine Retreat Center invites you to spiritual renewal retreats held every week from Sunday to Friday. Enter the presence of God with vibrant praise and worship. Listen to the life-changing scripture messages. Experience the healing power of the sacraments. Led by Father John Kanicheri and Father Dibin Aluasheri and the Divine Retreat Center team. Special retreats to be led by Father Augustine Valuran with the Divine Retreat Center team are Inner Healing Retreats from October 23rd to 28th The Advent Retreat from December 4th to 9th and December 11th to 16th Emmanuel Conference with a Youth Retreat and Family Renewal Retreat from December 18th to 23rd You're welcome to stay for Christmas the Christmas Retreat from December 25th to 30th. This year we have a special weekend renewal retreat for spiritual growth on October 22nd and 23rd. For more details, contact us at divineretreatcenter at gmail.com.